The reason that it is so hard for myself to find a new amazing full-time job in 2024 is not because of artificial intelligence. It's not because of how amazing and incredible this quote unquote new technology is. The reason that it is so hard for myself and thousands of other Americans to find a new good quality job is really because of outsourcing. Whether it's nearshoring to Mexico or some other place in the Caribbean, or whether it's traditional offshoring to places like India and the Philippines. Yes, this has been happening for a long, long time. But over the past few years, it truly feels like there's no rules. There's no regulations. There is nothing that is stopping these greedy, greedy corporations from doing whatever it takes to save a couple of bucks. In a lot of cases, to save thousands and thousands of dollars per employee. I mean, there's nothing stopping a company from taking half of their workforce and shipping them overseas. We've talked about John Deere moving all their operations to Mexico. Who's stopping them? Who's adding new tariffs to things they may import back into America? What penalties or punishments are any of these companies seeing for taking a good chunk of their workforce and offshoring them to India? Yes, it's saving the company tons of money. It's boosting up their stock price because these companies are cutting their cost. But why shouldn't they do it? If there's no penalties, there's no punishment, why not? And I guess there's still enough money in the top 1% to be able to buy their products and services. Because it seems like the average American can't afford really any discretionary spending, any spending above what the bare necessities are. So I really don't know how the average American is affording these 700 to $1,000 car payments on these brand new cars. I don't know how they're staying in their house when every study we see shows that the average American can't afford anywhere between a $400 and $1,000 emergency. None of this is adding up, especially the fact that these corporations and America at large are addicted to cheap foreign labor. And today I wanna to kind of dive into it. I don't know if I have the answer, but I wanna go over some reports uh, about what's going on with American offshoring and just really dive into the fact that American corporations will do whatever to save money, even if it means thousands and thousands of hardworking Americans can no longer find a job. Let's dive in. Our first article today is from usafacts.org. And as always, all of my articles I mentioned are referenced down in the description below so you can read the whole thing. I'm just gonna talk about the highlights and what pertains to our conversation we're having today. The headline is, how many immigrants are in the American workforce? Of the 169 million workers in the United States, more than 32 million are immigrants. That's over 19% of the workforce. This article was updated on Monday, August 12th, 2024, which means it has the latest and most up-to-date data and stats when we dive into that a little bit later. The article goes on to say that immigrants make up over 19% of the U.S. workforce as of June 2024, over 32 million out of the total 169 million and participate in the labor force at a higher rate than native-born workers, according to the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Foreign-born workers are people who reside in the United States, but who were not U.S. citizens at birth. Specifically, they were born outside of the United States, or one of its outlying areas, such as Puerto Rico or Guam, and neither parent was a U.S. citizen. The BLS's definition includes both legal and undocumented immigrants. There were 30.9 million foreign-born people employed in the U.S. in June 2024. The total foreign-born labor force is 32.2 million people, including those that were employed and unemployed. That month, foreign-born workers were 19% of the active labor force and 18% of the total possible labor force. So if it... So if it seems like everyone around you is a foreign born worker, if it feels like you can't get the same job opportunities, especially for entry level or low barrier of entry jobs, then you're not crazy. 
the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics has your back with this number. I mean, 19% of the total workforce is foreign born. I mean, that's one thing to come to the country uh, legally and properly, but let's be honest, I don't think that is the majority of those statistics. How does that number compare to the numbers of native born workers? There were 130.9 million native born workers employed in the US in June 2024. Out of a total native born workforce of 136.8 million, the native and foreign born populations had similar unemployment rates, 4.3% and 4.2% respectively. Since dropping to a low of 61.8% at the beginning of the pandemic, the immigrant labor force participation rate has recovered to 67% in June 2024, higher than the pre-pandemic level of 65.8% that same month in 2019. The labor force participation rate is a percentage of the civilian non-institutional population 16 years and older that is working or actively looking for work. Both the native and foreign-born participation rates dropped in the early months of the pandemic in spring 2020, with foreign-born participation falling more. Since then, the labor force participation rate of foreign-born workers has risen faster than that of their native-born colleagues. The native-born rate remains below its pre-pandemic levels. So let's unpack that a little bit more. What usafacts.org, you know, an official website with official government numbers is saying is that both the native and foreign born participation rates sunk, but since then, the participation rate of foreign born workers has risen faster than that of their native born colleagues. The native born rate remains below its pre-pandemic level. So what is that telling us? It's telling us that foreign-born workers have been able to re-enter the workforce at a rate that's higher than the native-born population, right? So what's that saying is, it could be for whatever reason. It could be because the labor is cheaper. It could be because of the jobs that are opening are less glamorous than the jobs that were available pre-pandemic. So we could talk about, oh, it takes a while to create a new normal and, you know, you got to adjust out of a pandemic. Well, really, it seems like the foreign born workers are able to make those adjustments and are able to enter the workforce. So what's going on? What is the main reason that, fo that native born workers are still struggling when people from other countries, not even born in the U.S., are entering the workforce at an OK rate? Doesn't make sense. Following a Great Recession spike, the unemployment rate for both native and foreign-born workers generally declined through the 2010s before rising even higher in 2020 during the pandemic. In June 2019, foreign-born unemployment rate was 2.7%. The native-born unemployment rate was 4.1%. So yeah, those are the, that's the discrepancy in numbers even before the pandemic. Rates for both groups fell back to below 4% in June 2022 and 2023 before rising in the ensuing year. As of 2023, a higher percentage of the foreign-born workforce was male, compared to the native-born workforce, 52.3%. So if men are supposed to be the head of the household, the people responsible in their household for making the money, earning the wages, it shows that the foreign born workers have a higher percentage of males who are able to get a job than American born. Now, obviously in America, we got different rules. Uh, men are working, women are working, everybody's working, right? But in other countries and other cultures, the onus is more on the man to work. So I guess that makes more sense that it's not as evenly split. There's a little bit higher percentage of male foreign-born workers who are able to work as opposed to male USA-born workers. In general, the labor force participation rate for women increased more from 2022 to 2023 than the participation rate for men, with rates rising the most for foreign-born women from 55% to 56%. Still, they had a lower participation rate than foreign-born men or native-born men and women. So we're seeing the participation rate of 
USA born men drop, but the participation rate of all women increasing. So women are more able to get jobs at a higher percentage than men in the US. So women born domestically and abroad are able to get a job at a higher percentage than a few years ago, but foreign born men are able to get jobs at a higher rate than USA born men. In terms of race and ethnicity, 73% of the foreign born labor force was Hispanic, 48%, or Asian, 25%. Labor force participation rose for all included races. And like I said, this whole article is linked down in the description below, and it shows the whole race and ethnicity makeup of immigrant workers in a nice little pie chart. How much do immigrant workers earn? Now here's the key. Here's the thing that is going to be the main reason. We're gonna go over a lot of different reasons. For me, this is the main reason for USA's addiction and obsession with hiring foreign born labor because really you can get it on the cheap. 2023 median weekly earnings for full-time foreign born workers was 86.6% of what their native born counterparts earned. So. If you go and hire someone from another country, on average, on the median, you're going to get someone at 86.6% of the cost of hiring someone from the USA. Now, we've thrown out a whole bunch of numbers and you know there's all these uh, different theories and stuff like that, but this is from usafacts.org, an official government website. And the actual number is that, no joking around, no exaggeration, the median wage that you have to pay a foreign born worker as opposed to a USA born worker is 86%. Foreign born men brought home $1,051 a week compared to $1,238 for native born men. Foreign born women earned $899 compared to $1,025 for native born women. So if we're ranking these four categories from top to low, on how much employers would have to spend a week. The top earner would be 1,238 for native born men. And then in second place would be foreign born men bringing home $1,051 a week. And then third would be 1,025 for native born women. And fourth would be foreign born women earning $899. So really, According to these statistics, a foreign born man makes, even though it's a little bit, it's almost break even, but still makes a little bit more on average than native born women. For the women who think you're not getting paid enough, well, here's the stats right now. Not only are men making more money a week than you, foreign born men, not even from your country, are making more than you are. In some instances, foreign born workers out earn their native born counterparts. Foreign born Hispanic workers earned 83.6% of their native born Hispanic counterparts. Whereas foreign born white, 12.7%, black, 5.7%, and Asian, 2.7% workers earned more than their native born counterparts. So if you're Hispanic, statistically, you're going to make less than your Hispanic background, born, USA born counterpart. But if you are white, black or Asian, and you're from another country, statistically, you will make more than your native born counterparts. So that is pretty crazy that there's these three groups of people statistically that will make more money being born from another, being born in another country than being born in the USA. And now we know that foreign born men statistically, officially, make more than native-born women. The website Hire With Near has a full comprehensive guide to hiring remote foreign employees. We're not gonna go over this whole thing, but let's see what it's like if you are an employer and the things that you have to think about and do you really have that many considerations to hire someone from another country? The article says, remote work is here to stay. 
Businesses of all sizes must adapt and adjust their recruitment practices to learn how to hire remote foreign workers. Hiring employees from different countries has many advantages and challenges that need to be considered. This guide will explore the ins and outs of recruiting a foreign employee, including legal requirements, cultural considerations, and communication barriers. By the end of this article, you'll know how to hire foreign workers and be ready to accelerate your journey toward building and scaling your team with international remote employees. Now keep in mind, remote is here to stay for people from other countries. People from other countries can literally work remote because they're in a completely different country. But if you're born in America, if you're a U.S. citizen, you can't even work from your house in the country, but your colleagues can work from a different country. Tell me how that's fair. Can U.S. companies hire remote workers from a foreign country? The answer is yes. U.S. companies can hire international workers legally. However, in most cases, you cannot hire a remote team as direct employees unless you have a legal entity in the worker's country of residence. But there is another option, hiring them as independent contractors. Contract arrangements still allow you to provide an employment-like experience with full-time roles and paid time off. Additionally, it's possible to offer other employee benefits, such as health insurance or gym memberships. Contract arrangements still allow you to provide an employment-like experience with full-time roles and paid time off. Additionally, it's possible to offer employee benefits such as health insurance or gym memberships through online methods. This makes it easier to ensure your remote foreign workers have access to all they need for optimal job satisfaction and performance. Do we care if the U.S. born employees have optimum job satisfaction? No, we do not. Do we do training so that our U.S. born employees have quality performance? No, we do not. <laughs> and then it goes over six main benefits of hiring international remote workers. I like how they call them <laughs> remote workers just to make it kind of sound a little bit better instead of just foreign born workers because you're not hiring people who can work remotely even from their house, God forbid, another country with a lower cost of living. Reason number one. You'll have more talent to pick from. When hiring across borders, companies benefit from having access to a much larger talent pool of qualified professionals. By tapping into global markets, you can find the right candidate with the necessary qualifications. Because as we read before, according to employers, all US born citizens are underperformers and unqualified and lack the essential skills. So just get it from another country, no big deal. It's good for branding. Having a multicultural workforce is great for branding and attracting future candidates. Working with people from different countries can create a vibrant and stimulating work environment, helping you develop your employer brands. But if these companies are so obsessed with everyone being in person, but if you just offshore your work to another country, are you really gonna have a vibrant workplace when everyone is just, well, when all the US born people are coming into the office and half of their team, you're just talking over Zoom? I mean, it's not like, you're bringing people to this country and paying their visas and all this other kind of stuff all the time. You're really just trying to find independent contractors to not give benefits, not give health insurance, not give any of this kind of stuff, but just get them for a lower wage than their U.S. counterparts. You'll always be on time. Tapping into the global workforce lets you employ talented professionals in other parts of the world. Having such a presence across different time zones can be a huge advantage. For instance, if you need an employee covering certain working hours on other continents, you can hire a remote foreign worker close to that region. Alternatively, if you prefer working with someone close to your own time zone, then hiring remote foreign workers from Latin America can be ideal for your needs. And here we get to the meat of the matter. Don't really make this the fourth point, guys. Out of six points, you're gonna make this fourth because let's be honest, for an employer, this following reason is number one. You can pay lower salaries. There we go. There it is. One of the major benefits of hiring remote foreign workers is that their salary expectations are often lower than those of domestic employees due to their lower cost of living. So yeah, if you bring someone over here or if someone is foreign born and you're just sponsoring them, well, you're probably not gonna save as much money because this rent is out of control no matter what country you're born in. And the cost of dining out and going anywhere is out of control no matter where you're born. But if you can hire someone and they can stay in their low cost country, well, winner, winner, chicken dinner, you got it all figured out now. Depending on the country, living costs can be significantly less than in the US. Most countries outside of the West 
are much lower than the U.S. The U.S. is like one of the most expensive countries on the planet. For example, some countries like India have relatively low minimum wages at only $2.15 U.S. cents daily. So we're not even, what? We're not even talking about $2 an hour, $2 daily. Wow, yeah, that, that is a big, big cost savings for American employers, wow. Meaning U.S. employees can gain significant cost savings compared with domestic talent while still offering competitive salaries to remote workers in relation to their own local labor markets. You should be worried about making and offering competitive salaries to you know, U.S. citizens who are struggling at a higher rate than in a long time. I mean, I had someone comment the other day that they're 50 years old and this is the worst they've seen. I mean, to me, this job market is worse in 2008 and 2020. And someone else said, oh, well, it's always been hard. It hasn't been this hard. It really, really hasn't. I know that people have always struggled and things have never been perfect, but this is the hardest it's ever been for me to get a job. And I think a lot of people would agree with that sentiment. Hiring qualified remote foreign workers from Latin America can save anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of what they would pay to a U.S. employee. So the official numbers from the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor says that on average, on the median, a foreign-born worker will make 86 percent of their native-born counterparts. But now this company that I'm assuming specializes in nearshoring, that's why this article even exists, says that as an employer, you could do what's best for shareholder value and what's best to lower your cost and hire someone that is 30 to 70% of what you'd pay a US employee. So their solution for employers is not to train the people from the US, the solution is not to treat people with the US with dignity and respect. Their solution is hire someone from Latin America and you might only pay 30% of what these greedy, greedy, <laughs> sarcastic, US born employees are looking for. You can take advantage of these cost savings by investing in a talented foreign workforce while reallocating resources to other areas, such as marketing, product development, or customer service. <sighs> wow. <laughs> Do I need to worry about paying taxes in their home country? Yes. When you hire a remote worker in a foreign country, it's important to consider the taxation laws of their home country. Depending on the specific regulations in that country, you may be responsible for paying taxes on behalf of your employee. However, if you partner with a remote hiring agency, they may take care of this process for you. Alternatively, you can hire workers as contractors to avoid many taxation issues. Do I have to take care of a remote workers' benefits like health insurance? It depends. If you're hiring foreign if you're hiring remote foreign workers in an employee-employer relationship, you do need to account for remote workers' benefits, such as health insurance. Depending on the country you're hiring in, there may be certain legal requirements that you must meet to offer a fair and safe employment package to your remote worker. However, if you plan on hiring your foreign workers as remote contractors, you are not required to pay for benefits. This is one of the reasons why hiring remote workers on a contractual basis is so desirable for U.S. companies. I really don't even know what to add to these statistics. Let me know how you feel about this, but to me, this is just disgusting. I mean, I understand that companies need to make money, but I mean, at what cost? And why are there no regulations behind this? The companies should have some kind of regulation to hire a certain amount of US employees. I mean, if given the choice, why would an employer not do this? We saw that on average, the official numbers are a foreign born worker will make 86%. And then this, I guess, nearshoring company says that they can help you get someone to 70 to 30% of what you would pay a US born employee. And then if you go with the contract route, you don't have to pay any sort of health insurance. You don't have to give them any kind of benefits. You don't have to do anything. And apparently, if you go to India, according to this article, you could pay someone $2 a day. If you know the going market for something is $100,000 a year, or even if it's $80,000 a year, to take that same workload and give it to someone making $2 a day, I mean, 
these companies are disgusting. I mean, I don't even know what to say. I might actually be speechless for once. So let's, let's continue reading and seeing what other great cost savings you can have as an employer outsourcing your labor. Should I pay for remote workers' equipment? This usually depends on the working relationship. If your foreign remote worker is an employee, you should pay for the necessary equipment they need to do their job. Depending on the specific role, this could include things like a computer, software licenses, and other tools. It's important to ensure that your foreign employee has everything they need to be successful and productive working from home. However, if the employee is a contractor, you are not required to pay for their equipment. Sure, outsource it to India, pay someone $2 a day, have them use their own computer, <laughs> their own equipment, just, don't add any value, don't contribute anything besides a ridiculously low salary, and that's it. Like, how do you sleep at night? And then, you know, it also goes on, do you gotta pay for employees to have good internet service? Who cares, right? <laughs> You're paying them $2 a day, you know. No matter what they do, it's gonna be worth that amount of money. Which roles are suitable for hiring international remote workers? administrative support, virtual assistance, customer service, finance, marketing, software engineering, and IT. So on one hand, all companies and a lot of Americans are worried about their privacy and security and cybersecurity and all this good stuff. And on the other hand, employers are like, oh, let's just outsource it to other countries. Well, if you're worried about the safety and security of your data inside the US, I mean, you don't have a problem with it being accessed by people intentionally from other countries. There, nothing can go wrong there. And then like finance, okay, marketing I can kind of get, and I think we're all used to, you know, virtual assistance and administrative support being outsourced, but finance, right? Like with Intuit, you want your taxes and all that kind of information being handled by people from other countries. I mean, where's the security? Where's the privacy? Everyone gets up in arms when, you know, Facebook shares their data and stuff like that, but no one seems to care if TurboTax is. That doesn't make any sense to me. So why is the USA addicted to cheap labor? Why does the USA want to do whatever they can to hire people located in other countries? Well, we've gone over a couple articles that point out pretty clearly. Price, cost, whatever you want to call it. And to me, the fact that there's, it's so easy for these employers to outsource their employment, to go to Latin America or India or other countries and take those jobs from the American workforce, which in my opinion is not demanding too much, is not unreasonable, but people just want jobs. They want jobs and they could take pay cuts, they could you know, be flexible, they could maybe not work at their dream ideal company, but they're not even getting the chance to even get jobs because all these jobs are quickly and sometimes quietly being offshore to other countries. So to me, because of all these reasons, the US's love of cheap foreign labor is absolutely destroying this country. Talk to you later.